Thank you. Uh, you may have noticed uh, when you uh, came in um, at the table with the agendas on them, uh, there were some cards. And I just want to uh, ex explain that uh, briefly and talk about a, a process that we are going to be implementing, uh, at least on a pilot basis. Um, and that is that uh, for individuals who wish to address the board, we would like them uh, upon their arrival to, to fill out a card that has a name and address and topic uh, to be discussed. And then um, what that will allow us to do is then collect those cards and hopefully we can group them by topic so that it, it sort of organizes the conversation. Um, and uh, we will no longer be requiring people to actually give um, their address. Uh, we've had some comments that uh, when people get up and give their address and it's being videotaped that it's a little uncomfortable to do that. The purpose of the card is to allow us to respond back to the individual who spoke. Uh, and so if there's uh, information or follow-up that's uh, necessary or required, then we will use the cards uh, to do that. It's probably going to take us a little while to, uh, you know, to get into the, the flow of that. So you know, I'm not expecting tonight that if you are going to address the board, you may have filled out the card already. Uh, but if you do, um, if you could fill out the card afterwards and get it to, to uh, Bondi, the secretary, uh, we would appreciate that. It will facilitate the follow-up. So from this point forward, all we'll be asking is people to, uh, to give their name and, and really no other information. Uh, we'll have the information we need on these cards. Um, so we'll see how it works. Uh, it's really an attempt to keep our, uh, our uh, business orderly, and uh, hopefully we'll accomplish that. So with that, we will move on to item two on the agenda, which is the academic spotlight. And tonight we have uh, from Gearing Elementary, Mrs. Linda Crandall, principal. Good evening, Dr. Green, Mr. McCartan, members of the board. I'm Linda Crandall, principal of Gearing Elementary. And tonight we are delighted to be able to highlight for you one of our exciting family events, the International Carnival, our first International Carnival. Last week, our Gearing families gathered at the gate of our Gearing Airport, grabbed their carry-on bags, that's a brown paper bag that is, and took off on their flight around the world visiting 23 different countries and filling their bags with many travel mementos. They had just enough time to stop for coconut juice at Thailand, take a look at Vegemite from Australia, and even try some Mexican pop. This event would not have been possible without the effort and the coordination of our Spanish teacher, Brooke Nowakowski, and so I'm delighted tonight to introduce you to Brooke, who will in turn give you the details of our International Carnival. Brooke? Hello, thank you for having us tonight. So we decided to host the International Carnival at Gearing um, as an opportunity that was actually free for the Gearing families to attend. Um, it was a chance for students to try new foods from around the world, a hands-on experience for all the students, and for them to learn about the world cultures and become more accepting of cultural differences. Um, in the past, I had done the, um, the Cinco de Mayo celebration in May with the, with the different schools, and I decided that I wanted to go further and expand to not only teaching just the language, but also the cultural aspect of um, the global culture. So each station, there was the 23 stations that Ms. Crandall mentioned. Each station included photos of the country, the country's flag, fun facts, books about the country, um, treasures such as dolls or those types of things, and the country's currency. Um, fortunately, I've been able to travel to many countries, and so a lot of the things that I had, um, I was able to draw in to be able to create the, the evening. Um, one of the things that they did was taste new foods, and the students had the chance to try Nopalito cactus and drink Mexican pop. And surprisingly, although they looked like worms, many of the students were very into the uh, Nopalitos. In fact, we had the rest of them today in Spanish class, and they loved them. So. Um, they also tried some tea in England, and many of the students surprisingly had never had tea before, especially with um, the different samples we had, sugar, honey, different things they could try with it, with milk. Um, for USA, they did the puzzle race, um, completing the map of the United States, and they could see how quickly they could get the puzzle together with all the states. In Japan, they learned how to make origami, 
and they could actually take some samples home with them with different um, directions and things so they could try it further. Um, they also played Mexican Lotaria, which is like a bingo game. And in Holland, they also, um, sampled some Dutch cheese and also got to try walking in wooden shoes. In France, um, they made it the Bilboquet, I believe it's. I'm the Spanish teacher, so I can't necessarily pronounce, <laughs> pronounce French. Um, and it's a ball and cup game, so they were able to make one of those, and they tried some French bread. Um, in Italy, they also tried Nutella, and they played a game of indoor bocce ball. Um, in Kenya, they played Mancala, and they learned the, the correct way to do that. And in Brazil, they played soccer in the gym with Miss Cornish. In Australia, the students, like Miss Crandall said, they um, were able to look at the Vegemite, and they did the Aboriginal bark paintings. Um, they also tasted coconut juice in Thailand, and also the coconut water. So they got to taste the difference between those. And they tried hummus and pita in Greece, along with making a message in Greek writing and making a mosaic. In India, they did the Rangoli designs, and they also celebrated um, by making a, there was a holiday in India that they celebrate siblings, and so that was a really nice thing, especially with a lot of the families. Um, they celebrate siblings once a year on a day, kind of like we celebrate Mother's or Father's Day, and the students, or the siblings make gifts for one another, and usually those are in the form of a bracelet. And so they were able to make those also in India, which was kind of a nice family idea. Some families even came dressed for the occasion. Miss um, Flynn from the Spanish teacher at the middle school brought her little son and they dressed in their Chinese outfits. Um, one of the nice things that I like really enjoyed about the evening was we saw a lot of full families coming. Mom, dad, grandparents, all the brothers, brothers and sisters, some even younger than the gearing age group and some from the middle school, the older siblings. Um, which was nice that they could spend the evening out together at a free event and be learning something along the way. Um, special thanks to the St. Clair Middle School National Junior Honor Society. The students were amazing and they came and helped. A lot of my Spanish one students <coughs> came and helped out um, because we had so many stations, we needed lots of volunteers. And also the teachers who helped, Mrs. Towler, Ms. Cornish, Mrs. Selecki, Mrs. Malberg, Ms. Natchke, and Mrs. Mananen. Um, these were some just some quotes that were feedback from families. Um, Mrs. Sturdy actually had posted on her Facebook, I am jet lagged after touring the world tonight with my three gators. It was clear that a lot of time went into planning this event. There were photos from nearly every country, currency, clothing, local games, and much more. A big thank you to Senorita Nowakowski and everyone who helped. Um, and fortunately, we also had the Times Herald there to cover the event. Um, and they did a nice article on in Friday's newspaper. And they have um, a quote from one of the parents. I think this is a great idea, said Amy Pergetone, as her three children visited France to try long, thin baguettes of bread. It's exposing the kids to a lot of different cultures. And it was truly a trip around the world in 80 minutes. I feel like the students were able to see some things that they were somewhat familiar with, but also that they were able to just see pictures and things from other countries and even treasures and trinkets that they might not have experienced before, maybe get them interested in learning more. Definitely some of the students, feedback in my classes that I got today, a lot of the students really enjoyed it. And the ones that weren't able to make it felt like they missed out on something. Um, so definitely a lot of positive feedback. And we actually will be hosting another one of these events at Eddie on on February 23rd, so if any of you are interested in attending, we'll be there from 6 to 8. Um, did you have any questions about the Gearing International Carnival? Any questions for Brooke? Just a comment. Looks like there was a lot of work put into it, and it looked really nice. Well, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you for doing all of that. We thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Our next presenter from St. Clair High School, Mr. Ron Miller. Dr. Green, President McCartan, and members of the board tonight, uh, first of all, thanks for the support that you continually give the East China School District in providing opportunities for the various buildings to demonstrate their programs. I thought that was really cool, so mm -hmm. I'm glad that we're uh, on the stage with them tonight. 
Accompanying me, I have three outstanding teachers for my English department. I have Ms. Laura Distorath, who teaches ELA 9 and ELA 11, Ms. Christy Sagan, who teaches ELA 9 and ELA 10, and Ms. Christina Rick, who teaches ELA 9, French 1, and French 2. They're going to be doing a presentation on a program to called Total Reader. They use Total Reader and Reader's, Work Jot, or Re Reader's Workshop, excuse me, uh, to uh, I, you know what, I'm just going to be quiet. I'm going to get out of the way because <laughs> they know what they're talking about. They got a, have a really brief presentation. I think you're going to be impressed. Thank I'll you. I'll turn Ms. Christy Sagan. Hi, good evening. Um, we want to start with this quote here taken from Professor Richard Vacca from Efficient Decoders to Strategic Readers. It says, adolescents entering the adult world of the 21st century will read and write more than at any other time in human history. They will need advanced levels of literacy to perform their jobs, run their household, act as citizens, and conduct their personal lives. Um, so what we're going to explain here is the, this total reader program. And we always ask ourselves as English teachers, who can read, who can't read, and who won't read? And we also have many parents asking questions such as, how well can my child read, and is my child on track for college? Um, so what is Total Reader? Total Reader is a web-based reading assessment and improvement program, so it's all online. Um, and students are introduced to various reading selections meant to determine their lexile reading level. So it's based on comprehension, and it's individual. Um, so lexiles, um, what is a lexile? Um, lexiles are like inches. It's a universal accurate measuring system. Um, it measures the current ability, it tracks their growth, and it shows their ability to comprehend. Once again, individualized and all web-based. Here are some common, um, the lexiles of common material. Um, average high school graduate is at 1150 lexile. The ACT is written at a 1210. Um, the New York Times is at a 1380. Um, this is a great um, visual for average lexiles for entry-level jobs. If you'll notice, education and training in the upper left hand for 1320 and 1370 for lexile. Mm -hmm. High school graduate, again, at 1150. So we show this to the students um, before we begin the total reader program to kind of let them um, figure out where would they fit um, for their chosen profession. Mo most of them are quite surprised. Um, this right here has to do with the Common Core Lexile level. Um, the Common Core is the, the top line, um, and it shows that where we're at now at the bottom line, we're four grade levels behind um, as far as Lexile is concerned. And so we're, it kind of sets a bar for us to teach toward. Um, Christina's going to show you a little bit more about the actual program. Hi, I'm Christina Rick. Um, next slide. All right, so how does Total Reader work? This is a screenshot of Total Reader. This is what our students see when they log into the computer. So they have a bunch of different folders that they can choose from. They can choose either fiction or nonfiction. And they can choose what, what is interesting to them. Uh, so there's a music category, there's a family category. I'm pretty sure there's an animals category on there. I know a lot of students like that one. And so they'll choose something that's interesting to them. And one of the most interesting things about it is that the folders constantly update as the student's lexile changes. And each time they log in, they'll see different things. So they're not reading the same passages over and over and over. Um, and they're unique to each student. So if a student's lexile is higher, they're going to have different reading passages than a student whose lexile is lower. Uh, this is also a screenshot of what it looks like when a student actually chooses a passage out of the folder. Um, the student will read the passage and there will be a blank where the circle is and you can see where the arrows point. There's different words to choose that go in that blank so we can see if, so we can see what the student's lexile level is as they're going through these passages and filling in the blanks here. Okay. Um, what can Total Reader do? It can identify student lexile levels. It can provide individualized reading selections and suggestions. It can report lexiles to student, teacher, and parent. And like we were saying, a lot of parents ask us, where's, where's my student at? Are they college ready? We get that a lot when they're in ninth grade. How, how much do they have to improve if they want to go to this certain school? So this shows us where that child is and how much they might need to improve. Um, it can also create detailed class, school, and district reports, which is useful for us when we're trying to show growth th throughout the school year. <coughs> Um, next, using Lexiles to select books, 
we're trying to select books that are appropriate for a student's Lexile level. Um, on the yellow end, you can see that's too easy for the student. The green is the area that we're trying to target. Where the line is, is this student's exact Lexile. So we're trying to fall in that green area so that it's not too difficult or too easy for the student. And that would be something that they could read on their own. The red level is where the student probably would not understand the material on their own, but if, if helped, the student could understand. So we're trying to fall within that targeted Lexile, the green area for each student, and help the student to choose something that's interesting to the student, but also at their appropriate level, so that they can, so that they can grow as readers. Good evening, I'm Laura Distareth, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the wonderful data that we get as a result of Total Reader. Um, Christy started off with the idea of who can read, who can't read, who won't read. This is where Total Reader is so advantageous to us in the sense that what we can do is we can look at where our freshmen started the year. So this is the current sophomore class when they came in as freshmen in September, which would be the blue bars. You can see that we had 40% at the advanced level. However, by the end of the school year in June, we had improved to 52% of them. So the advanced level is going upward and the proficient and in, in needs intervention all the way down to a 19%. And so that's really exciting for, especially as English teachers, where we don't necessarily have a lot of opportunities for hard data to be able to have something that does measure a student's reading ability instead of just kind of having a feeling. This also is a wonderful way to be able to use the data that we are able to take away from the Total Reader program. When they came in in September, the freshman class last year, the blue bars indicate how ready they were to take the ACT, how ready they were to read some of that general citizenship material that um, Christy alluded to earlier, uh, to be ready for the workplace, community college, and university level. And so you can see that over the course of the school year last year, from the blue to the red, we saw significant improvement in terms of getting our students ready for the ACT. Up to 61% of them by the end of the school year were ready for that 1210 Lexile. Um, actually, it says 1180 there. And that is at the end of their freshman year. They still have a year and a half to go before they get to that March of their junior year test date. So that we thought that was exciting. And if you look at the university level, we went from 1% ready to 16% ready. So we were very encouraged by that as well. We always hear that reading is the core. It, is, um, e it equals success in all common core areas. So what we did is at the end of last school year, we took our top 15 readers and our bottom 15 readers, and we went in and we looked at, well, what grades did they earn this quarter? And so the blue bar indicates how many A's our top 15 readers collected over the course of the quarter, how many B's, C's, D's, and the one singular E. And then the bottom 15 readers, we looked at the same thing. And you can see that their numbers are dispersed. And interestingly, of the A's and B's, the majority of those A's and B's for those bottom readers came in a, um, an art class, a music class, gym class, something besides your social studies and science and English, which require quite a bit of reading. So those were some interesting facts we could extract from that data. One of the most exciting stories of the year for us was this one particular young man who, as a freshman, came into the high school reading at a 660 Lexile, which is the equivalent, equivalent of middle third grade. Uh, when I met with his parents at conferences, they were shocked. They had no idea that he had fallen so far behind, um, but they knew he was struggling in every core area. And he read very little, if at all, on his own. And so his parents and I worked very diligently all year long. Um, they were extremely committed and focused on helping their student improve. They went and got library cards. They had reading lists. They had um, reading groups in their house. And they really made it a family focus. And by the end of the school year, he had improved up to a 900, which is middle sixth grade, and was on track to be at grade level by the end of 10th grade. 
So that was a, uh, we felt, a very, very powerful story. And the giving parents the knowledge and as teachers having the knowledge of who needs our help and, and who doesn't. So thanks to the East China School District Supporters Grant, we were able to expand our program this year from just the ninth grade to the ninth and 11th grade. We were able to focus on that 11th grade since uh, one, they are taking the ACT this year, and two, we had no data on them whatsoever. Our current 10th graders, we at least have some data from last year to know who are the students who are struggling and who are the students who are ready. So we chose to go with the current 11th graders so that we can, like I said, um, target them and help them know, uh, one, what is their current lock style? Are they ready to take the ACT? Are they ready to go to college? Are they ready to go into a work field and read at the necessary level? Some of our goals moving forward would be to have the ability to track a student's progress um, from 9th through 11th. I, I'll be honest with you, I'm so curious to know how my young man is doing this year and if he's getting toward that grade level. So I'm excited to hopefully be able to next year see where he is at and if he has made that progress that we anticipated. Uh, we also hope to be able to increase our college readiness in all of our curricular areas through improved black style scores. We hope to expand our, our focus throughout all curricular areas so that our science teachers and social studies teachers as well are aware of you know, what material they're giving what students and knowing what students would be able to read the article on their own with no assistance and which ones would need some vocabulary and comprehension help. Are there any questions? Questions? Go ahead. A lot of, a lot of really interesting data just from, from a, I'm not a teacher, but I'm, I'm a data person. Are there any correlations, you mentioned the ACT and where it's written, are there any correlations between ACT scores and the Lexile numbers? Well, that's something that we will be able to have for the first time this year because we have those Lexiles for our 11th graders. When they do take it in March, that's something we will be able to so get. So we'll start compiling where it is. Right, yeah. Exciting stuff. Mm -hmm. Question on the process, the, when you develop the baseline on it, is there sort of an individual assessment somewhere early on that gives you that baseline and then you build from there? How does that work? Well, when the student logs in the very first time to Total Reader, they the program takes them through a very short 10 question fill in the blank reading. It's pretty generic to start, but at least sends the program in the right direction for that student. And then it, they say it takes between 40 and 50 word selections. So if you remember the screenshot that we had where they have to select a word to go in the blank, after about 40 to 50 of those word choices, the program feels very confident in assigning a Lexile, and then that's where their baseline is established. Okay, because that I guess leads me to, to my other question of how you um, sort of measure whether it's comprehension or how, how how does the program measure whether or not the person has successfully mastered you know, that level and is ready to move? How does that work? Um, it basically, if it depends on how many word choices the student gets right or wrong as to whether or not it sends the student in a higher direction or lower direction or keeps them in the same general reading area for the moment. And then basically when we look at the program, what they have to do when they read the passage they have to understand not just the content but know the vocabulary associated with that passage in order to move on successfully so it's really looking at reader comprehension as well as vocabulary strength and that's why when we look at books are Luxiled and people have Luxiles, and we've been working really hard with our media center we've held some book fairs trying to increase the you know, selection for our students mm -hmm. and trying to, with our Destiny Quest program, which allows the student to see what level that book is at, and if they know their targeted level, then they can, we can match our readers. So when we provide time in our classes for our sustain, sustained silent reading program, we know that individually every kid has the book that that person needs. Which probably leads me to my last question. I was intrigued by, I forget what the third, three categories of student was, but the third one was the one who won't read. Yes. Uh, and how, how does this program help <coughs> the child who won't read? 
Well, it helps us, first of all, understand and know who, for example, a 1390 Lexile would be a very high Lexile for a freshman. And if that freshman has never once passed an English class and they read at that level, now we have discovered that they <coughs> won't read. And so now it's a matter of how do we motivate that person to find the material that's interesting to him or her to find that reading could be enjoyable if I took the time. We give them choice, but we tell them with choice comes responsibility. Now it's, you know, in your hands, you have to take the time to find something that is of interest. Um, what's also really neat about the online portion of it is as they're reading the passage and um, choosing um, the words, the lexile is up on the screen. So they either see it go up or down, and they really want to get it up. Instant Even the ones that are the lower Instant readers. Feedback. Yeah, it's like, oh, it went up, it went up, it, oh, man, it went down. And so, and with the different options and the folders and the fiction and nonfiction and the choice, they can, you know, choose whatever it is that helps them get it up. Mm -hmm. So, yay, it went up, yay. So that's encouraging for the, um, the, the lower, I mean, all, all students. It's intriguing, just speaking for me, I'd love to hear back in another year or two how it's going. It was pretty exciting. Other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next item of business is the consent agenda. A motion will be in order to approve the consent agenda, including approval of minutes, payment of bills, financial statements, schedule of investments, and the appointment of the Marine City High School Scholarship Foundation representative. So moved. It's been moved by Mr. Bewer. Support. By Mr. Folsky. <laughs> All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Pose like sign. Motion carries. We'll now pause and recognize anybody wishing to address the board. Hope those cards didn't scare you away. <laughs> it doesn't appear to be anybody, so we will move on to reports and begin with the report from the superintendent. Dr. Green. Thank you. Well, as you probably heard, the governor did come out with his executive budget proposal for the state budget this last week. And this budget is now a starting point for the legislature to work on the budgeting process. So this proposal um, does continue the best practices money, um, and it adds a few more practices in there, which we should have uh, no problem meeting that incentive. It also offers uh, the retirement offset, which... Um, which was good, which is good and yeah. continues that money and it offers a little bit more money in those areas. However, it also includes a 3% increase in the retirement rate, which is about $700,000 to our district. So if you take the money and a little bit extra that they added, but then they added this new retirement rate, we're actually about negative about $150 per pupil just on the state money. So when it says they're offering more money to schools, they're not exactly uh, getting into all of the details that actually happen for schools. And the big one is that retirement piece. So now the rate is about 27.37%, and they've already predicted next year it's going to be over 31% that they charge school districts for retirement based on payroll. So that's a huge factor. Um, as you might recall, when I first came to the district, it was around 12%. So, um, unfortunately, they continue to ratchet up that rate. They control the benefits. They control everything about the retirement, but then they charge, on the, they charge the districts for that, for that amount. So, uh, we hope that they will um, do something about the system, that they will continue to work on um, modifying the system, but they have not yet. So, um, that, is a, that is a huge problem. Of course, the other problem facing us is declining enrollment. And... Um, as a lot of people know, I think by now, our kindergarten count and birth rate in the district has been lower the last few years, and so we're graduating almost 200 more students than we're bringing in kindergartners. So that means we're declining enrollment each year, which translates to dollars. So if we lose 170 students, that will be over a million dollars as well. So again, the bottom line is we have a challenging budget situation, and we will be continuing to work on our budget process in the next few weeks. We plan to have special board meetings um, in March, on March 26th and April 16th, as we work through those budget issues. And as a lot of people know, we've started bargaining with our support groups, and that will be a huge factor as well. 
We hope to be able to share our MEEP results shortly. I think tomorrow is when they're going to lift the embargo on those results, so we should have that at our March board meeting. Kindergarten Roundup is coming up March 21st and 22nd. This will be held right here at Central Office, so we encourage all those parents with little ones at that age to plan on attending this event. Count Day was this last week, uh, February 8th. This determines about 10% of our funding, at least that's what we think. Of course, the legislature can change that as they did this past year. It had normally been 25% uh, and they changed it to 10% in May of last year. So we'll see how that works out. Applications are due on February 17th for the supporters uh, fund. And I don't know if you were aware, we had this Chili Heart run last uh, Saturday up at St. Clair Middle School and ran the path, and Mike Alley did a great job organizing that along with the uh, East China supporters. It was a lot of fun. I think we had 180 runners registered, so uh, great job to the supporters, and that money goes towards these types of grants, so people will get their grants in next uh, this Friday. We are continuing to work on bond projects for the summer and energy projects for our systems, so we have a timeline and schedule uh, almost ready, and we will be getting that going in the next couple of months. And last but not least, the governor did proclaim this week as uh, Principals Week in Michigan. So we have some of our principals standing, out, sitting out there. So we're proud of our schools and proud of our administrators and do a great job in helping students and parents every day of the week. So we thank you for that, and we encourage uh, staff members to recognize their school leaders during Principals Week. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Green. Any questions for Dr. Green? Mr. Clay, can Just you one. Um, on the MEEP results, roughly what's, what's the lag between the embargo and when students receive their um, the students should get them very soon I think once they're they're unembargoed then we will send out those notes um, to parents almost yeah pretty quick thank you move on to the uh, student advisory meeting dr. Green well we did have student advisory this last week and uh, it's always great to meet with the students and and sit down and listen to what's going on in their world and we talked a little bit about scheduling classes for next year. They're studying that process. Um, and we talked about the Super Bowl ads that came out and some of the ones that they liked and didn't like. We also talked about the state finances and spent a little time on the state budget and what goes on with Lansing and how that affects our local district. And, and then we, we heard a little bit about their Michigan merit exam that's coming up for the juniors, which is in just a couple weeks, and the student council events. So. Lots of things going on in high schools and uh, great kids that come to these uh, student advisory sessions. We have uh, a lot to be proud of in our district. Thank you. Move on to item C, Parent Advisory Committee. Mr. Polsky. Uh, we had about 24 people attend the last meeting that uh, represents every building of the district. Uh, as you see on the agenda, the items that were covered, the kindergarten roundup, the budget, the uh, chili run, the scores, and re uh, the building reports, I found it pretty interesting. There was, there was a lot of activities going on. Uh, enrichment programs, there's carnivals coming up, there's a lot of uh, things going on. So they suggest if you go on the local district website, and they'll, they list the items that are, if you're interested in uh, things that are going on. And uh, uh, I'll get through my notes here. That's about it. Thank you, Mr. Folsky. Move on to enrollment and facilities, Mrs. Knuth. Good evening. Over the past 10 years, the board has heard several reports on our enrollment, uh, enrollment and facilities. I'm here tonight to give the board a review of our historical enrollment, share some enrollment projections, and give the current status of our building capacity and its usage. This historical slide should look somewhat familiar. You've seen it a lot. It demonstrates from the left kind of our high water mark of 5,770 students. It looks over that span from the fall count of 2001. As you work your way over to the right, the last bar is the fall of 2011, which is our enrollment count for this last fall's um, fourth Wednesday count of 4,731. That is a, um, a total decline of 1,039. 
Unfortunately, when looking to the future, uh, we continue to reject a decline in our student enrollment, flattening out near the 4100s. This uh, enrollment projection is calculated by taking our current students, rolling them forward, and making an assumption that we'll get about the same amount of kindergartners as we are currently getting annually. As you may know, we provide itinerant services for both Holy Cross and St. Mary's. We obviously are sending less and less staff to those buildings than we have in the past, as their enrollment has declined considerably during this time period as well. As, as you can see, and I'll just combine them for you, um, between St. Mary's and Holy Cross added together, they had 474 students back in 2001 and are down to 189 students total between the two buildings in 2011, which is a decline of 285 students over that time period. So there are very varying reasons for decline of school-aged children in Michigan, and it is a across all of Michigan. Obviously, the economy is a considerable factor, but another key factor is just the birth rate. And as you see this slide, the left slide is St. Clair County, and that's actually just 2006, 2007, 2008, and 2009. So just a four-year span, that's a 12% um, fewer births in 09, which is their most recent data compared to 2006. The right slide is the state of Michigan, and that is a longer time span. That first bar is 1990, middle bar 2000, and the latest data in 2009. As you can see, 18% fewer births in the state of Michigan. Um, during that time period. This here is our current enrollment. I'll just give you a chance to just look at that slide. So that, uh, those numbers represent the fall count. On the left side, our elementary schools, along with our early childhood developmental delay program. And then on the right side uh, are our secondary schools, the two middle schools and our three high schools totaling 4,731 students, which is the number that I shared on the initial slide of our fall count for 2011. When looking at districts uh, with um, similar, uh, our, our district first is configured uh, this way. Obviously, we have two communities, which is a somewhat of a unique feature. Um, our configuration has the two high schools, an alternative high school, two middle schools, and five elementary schools, equaling 10 schools for our 4,731 students. But when looking at um, other districts our size with similar student enrollment, the typical configuration you'll find, with, with a little variance, is generally one high school, one middle school, five elementary schools, obviously equaling seven schools, just with the nature of our, our two communities and our large land mass, we're not able to have that configuration. So when you take a look at our building capacity and usage, um, this is the space usage. This isn't the capacity as far as student enrollment. Uh, some rooms are unoccupied parts of days or perhaps are an open computer lab that could be used as a classroom if needed. Um, as you can see, we have a range from 66% um, to up to 94% occupied. Based on our current K-5 configuration, our elementary enro enrollment, when you look at the numbers, is not low enough to have only four elementary schools at this time. Obviously, it was just two years ago when we closed Washington. When you look at a similar slide for our secondary buildings, um, the range is from a low of 56 at Riverview East High School to 81% at St. Clair High School. So that's just kind of a snapshot of where we're at right now. Obviously, some thoughts for the future. You know, it doesn't seem likely um, that we would have just one middle school or high school. Um, we're doing some forward planning and thinking right now for looking at operating a district that has 4,100 students. And we'll continue to look at our space utilization, identify potential opportunities for consolidation of programs, obviously wanting to maximize all of our operational efficiencies. So we'll continue to do this work. Um, 
and in the upcoming weeks. Just wanted to give you a little snapshot there. I have a question. Mr. Folsky. Um, <clears throat> this information, can you send it to us or is it going to be online where I can gather it up or Certainly. However? We're going to post it online. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Richley. Um, besides the point that it troubles me that there's not enough births in the community, I, right. I <laughs> think that uh, the, the question that I have is, is there a time frame, I guess, it kind of didn't say, but is there a time frame to um, to propose another school to be closed, or is that something that's? I know it's always on the table or whatever to save money, but is that something? Well, I think this time of year we're looking to our staffing process. It's um, part of our normal process to take a look at our enrollment, take a look at our building usage, and so we'll be working on that the next few weeks. But um, we don't have any initial plans as far as like I made the comment about the elementary. Our numbers just aren't low enough there, but. We'll analyze it and obviously trying to match what Dr. Green shared about the, the budget statewide and our money and just make some good decisions in planning for the future. Mm -hmm. And the, because um, I saw the one slide with the declining enrollment, how the, uh, kind of like the projected what we're going to be in the future. Yes. Uh, is there any set date do you think that to expect that we would have to, um, like for an example in 2000, I believe 14 I mean that's quite a few that's kind of a big difference or whatever is that something that we're is that something that is in consideration that a school might be closed or something or well I think it's a little too early to tell I mean obviously these are projections they're based on the current students that we have right now and different things can happen in our community and in the state economy that can change those. But I think we're always wanting to be efficient, use um, our money wisely for our students. And mm -hmm. so we'll be working at, on those options. When you look at those numbers, it, it is a decline. The challenge is when you spread those students across 10 buildings, there's not an obvious immediate answer always, but we're going to be working on that and, and uh, bring, bring any ideas forward. OK, thank mm -hmm. you. Sure. Other questions? It's my recollection of, of the last time we went through a very rigorous process that had enormously complex variables related to them above and beyond just the number of bodies in a, in a building or right. per classroom or, or whatever. But, you know, I guess on Mr. Richley's point, it, you know, we're planning for, you know, even in 2014, 4,300 students in terms of long range planning before it begins to flatten out, you know, that does suggest when you look at um, the amount of usage we have of our space that if there is a more economical way to do it, we ought to be thinking about that right. as difficult as that might be. Right. But I suppose the takeaway message here is we will not be consolidating into one high school. <laughs> I, I shudder to think that what my phone is going to be like away. tomorrow. <laughs> no, I think, yeah, I think we want to make sure that's clear that we, we value the two high schools that we have in in the two communities the two middle schools that type of thing is certainly not something that we're looking at and I mean when you look at the size of the high schools um, St. Clair is still over 900 Marine City's you know 650 or something like that and uh, those are decent sized high schools it's just that you know they used to be a lot bigger mm -hmm. and uh, so it causes stress on the system but we know we're two communities we know we've got to deal with that and so I think we're really looking more at program efficiencies and what can we do to to maximize our, the facilities that we do have I agree I think it's a responsibility any other questions comments thank you Mrs. Thank you. all right we'll move on to um, Action items. Uh, first item for action is the telecommunications uh, provider. Uh, for purposes of discussion, I would entertain a motion to support the recommendation that the board approve the East China School District to be added to the SCCTEN consortium master telecommunications agreement for the period of July 1, 2012 through June 30th, 2015. So moved. Been moved. Was that Mr. Folsky? Yeah. Been moved by Mr. Folsky. <coughs> Support by Mr. Beaver. Dr. Green. 
Yes, this is a bid that we need to do every few years, and um, it's basically our phones, so our phone system, and it's offered you know, in a digital way these days, and we're in a consortium in the county with all the county districts. So the nice thing about this bid is it's actually lower than in the past, so our monthly costs would be reduced from about uh, almost 1600 to around 1350 per month. We still have free local calls, and then our long-distance calls are reduced down to um, less than three cents a minute, about 2.3 cents per minute. We also get um, reimbursement from the USF fund, which is a federal uh, grant that, that we have, so we get about 55% discount on this price as well. So we've been uh, fortunate, I guess, with technology these days, the price continues to drop every few years, and so it's dropped a little bit, so we're recommending that the that the board approve this agreement and we continue with our current phone system. How long have we been in this consortium? This, I think it's been three years um, with this current consortium, approximately. Is, is, Mr. Was Fulsky. there any other bids out there? Or we did not get any other bids on this on this particular work. Hmm. I'll be there. Okay. Other questions? Mr. Kennedy. Totally informational. We've got we've got in both cases, local and long distance. It goes down. In the local, it's a fixed dollar amount. That's the way it's done. And in the long distance, it's a rate which equates to usage. What roughly does our dollar amount equate to in long distance? You know, I don't think it's is is very much. But I don't really have that off the top of my head. I know that um, the we have about a thousand phone lines into the district so every teacher's classroom of course has a line and then we've got multiple lines but the way they do it digitally is it comes in through what are called PRIs which is like a primary rate um, I'm not sure the exact lingo but there's like 67 channels so it all goes through and since it's digital you don't need an actual line to each phone so we have a lot of value for the system that we have, and um, but I, I couldn't tell you the exact long distance charges that we have. It was, my question was a little bit on a tangent because it doesn't really, it's not effect, affecting yeah. the bid, but. Well, and back when I first got to the district, our long distance charges were about 10 cents a minute. So, I mean, it really has dropped, which is great. And I'm not, I'm not sure really why it drops other than maybe they've already got the lines installed and it's just not, they don't have the additional cost. Within district calling, there's different area codes. Um, do we have, in this, from one of our own buildings to another building, is any of that long distance? No. Um, all of the, the 676 number is our exchange, and so when you dial 765 and you dial 329, those are all local calls. So if you ever have to dial an 810, then you'd, that would be a long distance call. So just a, like a normal, like from your house to Port Huron is probably long distance. That would be the same for us. Thank you. You know the questions? All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> motion carries. Next item is the internet service provider. For purposes of discussion, a motion will be in order to approve the recommendation that the board award the ECSD internet service contract to St. Clair County RESA at a cost of $22.80 per student per year. So moved. Uh, moved by Mr. Bewer. Support. By Mr. Folsky. <laughs> Dr. Green. Thank you. This again is um, the same provider that we've had the last you know, number of years, probably about 15 years. Uh, the internet is provided by the RESA. We put in the fiber years ago and um, in order to get the the grant from the federal government, we have to have a contract with ERISA. So in order to do that, we have to bid it out every couple years. And so um, we did request bids, and we got this bid back. We did not get any other bids from any other providers. And um, so we are recommending go ahead with this price. It's the same price as it was. And uh, we do anticipate over the future, though, that we will, uh, again, be able to bid this out and possibly get better prices as we go forward as the same way as we have with telecommunications. Questions for Dr. Green? Mr. McNamee. Um, maybe I misunderstood you, but the only way we get the USF money is if we contract with RISA? 
No, um, the only way we get it is if we have a contract for this service. Okay. Um, do we, and um, then what, uh, I, why I'm guessing, do we know why no one else will bid this? Because they don't have the fiber in between the buildings. Okay, so Risa owns the fiber between right. our buildings? Yep. So it gives them an advantage, and, and the other providers would not have that. Uh, they'd have some a lot of infrastructure cost to put in. Okay. Um, I'm just kind of curious. So the fiber itself, in other words, Risa comes in and says, okay, you're, we're not going to contract with you. We're going to rip out our fiber. I'm just kind of curious what that's about. Well, I you mean, know, it kind of sounds strange to yeah, me. Yeah, that's that would be a little strange, but... Um, the fiber is, it's in between our building, and since also we have hubs and we have a lot of setups, I mean, again, we have probably around 2,500 computers in the district, and they're mm -hmm. all hot to the Internet. Um, I mean, this is, it's very good price for considering what you would get at your house. I'm not complaining about yeah. the price. I'm just asking how, the, what, how this thing <coughs> operates. Yeah. Right. Well, I know that, um, that they provide the service and it's over the fiber they own the fiber but then we have set up here in our district with hubs and things like that so no no i i appreciate that all i'm saying it sounds to me like okay we've got the fiber now we're going to set the price and that and we talk about competitive bidding when in fact that is a, a sham because it can't yeah. happen with it's hard for other bidders to bid on this and um but the other thing that we do we have other we have other services that we buy from the RISA in regards to this. Um, and so this is uh, a little bit of a, it is, it is a bid price, but it's also in conjunction with, you know, like Bitech, we get Bitech and Zango and oh, no, no, again, all I'm, these other I'm not things. criticizing it. I'm just saying when somebody says this is, we're putting this out for a competitive bid, it just sounds strange to me yeah, that it really hard is for not. Other people to bid it, on it. Well, it's not. It's not hard. It's impossible for them to bid on, basically. Yeah. Okay. So it's not really a competitive bid. It's like betting on a horse race when there's only one horse in the race. Wow. Well, <laughs> okay. That's all. I'm, well, I just wanted to understand it. I'm slow. Just wanted to pick up on it. That's all. All right. Any other questions? I am. Uh, uh, Mr. King Park. And this this is directed at the process and not not this bid because. I'm going to support this bid. It's a good mm -hmm. price. It's fast internet, but it's on the process, and in in there's been other bids that have come in, requests for bids that we've had trouble getting bidders on. There's been there's been um, flooring. There's been HVAC. Right. And we may be, to Mr. McNamee's point, hurting our s competitiveness by structuring our requirements or setting ourselves up such that it makes it tough to get more bids. When we asked, when we dug into it a little bit on the HVAC, yeah, there were some <coughs> reasons why nobody right. bid, and those reasons were under our control. And then here, the same sort of thing. So that some questions would be to this, would be just general questions. What can we do? When, when we talk about future getting more bids on it, what will we do to get bids? Will we will we be buying the fiber optics? Will we be waiting till fiber optics are uh, obsolete? Will we rent fiber optics from RESA? Just thoughts for going forward. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Polsky. <clears throat> you got quoted a dollar ninety per month. And then 55 percent cutback, and then you got 2280. What's the 12 months? Well, the 12 months times the dollar 90 is the 2280, and then we gotcha. apply once we once we pay that, then we put that on our forms to the government to try to get 55 percent reimbursed. So roughly. So the, the main reason for doing this bid is so we can get the reimbursement. Right. That's the main. That's the only reason we're really doing this so bid. Like we have gotten internet from the RISA ever since we agreed to go in consortium with the RISA in 1995 to put the fiber optics in and do all this work. Right. That was the whole point. But in order to get 55% reimbursement, we have to put it out for bids and, and, um, and award a contract. Okay. So that's why we're doing this. 
it, it, Mr. McNamee's point is, is well taken. I mean, it's no one else is going to be able to bid on it. They don't own the stuff. Um, but we want to get the 55% reimbursement, right? Absolutely. I mean, that's what we want to do. If, if we don't want to do that, then we wouldn't do this. But obviously, we want to do it. So that's why we're doing this. Okay. No, I'm confused. The, uh, the, I apologize. I, I might not be understanding this correctly. But if we don't go through RISA, we don't get the 55%. We, if we don't have a contract, we can't have internet if we don't go through the RISA right now because that, that's where the fiber is. Okay, and the other thing, how many other districts, do other districts go through RISA? All, All of them. them. Okay. And uh, we don't have any ideas of what the prices would be without RISA? It would be a lot more. Okay. <laughs> yeah, a lot more. Like yeah. millions of dollars. I think the original <coughs> price to put the fiber in was around $8 million something like that. So that's that's the kind of work that we did, you know, 12, 13 years ago to be in this position to be able to have the internet the way we have it. And then and then we do this process so that we can get reimbursement from the government because the government paid for a lot of people to put internet in for school districts. It's called E-rate program. So skinny button. which which further and really answers some of my questions about going forward on this, some right. of the backstory that, I mean, that, that totally, that's, that's a setup that's, that's big and that's beyond the scope of what we're talking about today, but yep. that's big planning. That was planning in 95. Right. And good planning when we had money to spend on exactly. capital projects. And we got a grant to do it. You know, we did a lot, a lot, a lot of this, almost all of it was through grants. <coughs> so it's a great service for the community. It's great, it's great for our district. And, and now we've got wireless throughout our buildings because we've added to the, the plan but um, certainly we need the internet and this will be uh, good for us to do that. Any other comments, questions? Hearing none. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We will move on to the next item, which is the all day, every day kindergarten. Again, for purposes of discussion, I will accept a motion uh, that uh, recommending that the East China School District change the kindergarten program to all day every day kindergarten uh, program effective the 2012-2013 school year. So moved. Been moved by Mr. Mm. Kennebar. Support by Mr. Beaver. Dr. Green. Thank you. As you know, the state of Michigan has been uh, very interested in districts providing all day every day kindergarten and. We have talked about it for a while in our district. And you may recall back in 2005 when we went to all day, alternate day kindergarten, um, there was some discussion then. And obviously, a lot of people were interested in us doing all day every day, but it's always been a cost issue. It's never been a question of the body of research that indicates that all day every day would be valuable for kindergarten students. In our particular program, we will have students that will be increasingly more ready for school, they will have higher academic achievement, and they will have improved attendance because when they come on a consistent schedule, that will help them in their attendance. We also feel that they'll have additional social and emotional growth by being here every day. So we know there's benefits in all day, every day kindergarten, and um, actually this last seven years, we've had a program where We've had about 100 students each year take advantage of our Kinder Academy. So those students were coming uh, all day, every day, because on the off days of our all day alternate day program, they were coming to Kinder Academy. So we know that it's been valuable for those students. And um, so based on all the research and all of the data that we've had in front of us, in, in particular the state of Michigan, um, interest in this we have decided to recommend this to the board the cost of the program will be approximately five hundred thousand um, dollars but if the state goes through with their half day and half pay um, program that would cost us about a million dollars in funding so the value of the of the program will be the opportunity for our youngest learners to have a consistent everyday program and also um, work on the standards that are appropriate for that age level. And um, so some of the things that we do in first grade, at the beginning of the year, we'll have mastered those in kindergarten, and so we'll get started faster in first grade as well. So we think it's going to carry through throughout our elementary program. 
And um, so anyway, I guess bottom line is we feel like this is the right thing to do. It's a strong foundation for our school. It's going to help us in our um, rigor and in, in helping our students do a better job uh, as they go through in student achievement. So we're recommending that we go ahead with all day, every day, beginning next year. Questions for Dr. Green? Mr. Richley? Um, the total cost, is that the total cost of the whole program, 500000 or that, is that the increase in the total? That would be the increase from our current program. Okay. That's the and increased cost in, in putting this program in. Now, <laughs> what, if, if we didn't do this, say the, or say the state does that half, um, half day, half funding thing, um, approximately a million dollars you said would be lost right because um okay and then uh, for lunch and breakfast is that something else is that something that we'll get funding for for we uh, we currently serve kids lunch so um, we would have about half you know we're, we're we currently have an all-day alternate day so we've got and we've got about 100 kids going to kinder academy so we would have a little bit more in lunch uh, a little bit more in lunch reimbursement okay and do you know approximately like an approximate guesstimate of how many incoming kindergarten students are pre like went to are preschool pre oh that went to preschool yeah. um i don't know that information oh, okay do you think it would be a majority or not um yes i do i think a lot of students are are taking preschool these days but i don't know that it would be a majority we have um there are several good preschool programs in the area um but i don't know that it's a majority yet <laughs> We would like it to be a majority. Yeah, <laughs> and something that I wanted to suggest, I don't know um, if this would be a good suggestion or not, but to, um, instead of switching over kind of like like with the breakfast in the class, how we had a trial program, is there a way that we could do a trial with like one elementary school that was something that a parent suggested to do um, instead of like bringing it all at once to, um, to the kid. I mean, it's kind of a shock to the system. Well, I think, I mean, I think the short answer to your, to your suggestion is, from my point of view, and I, I know other board members could weigh in, but um, I, no, I don't think that would be a good idea. You'd have, then you'd have disparities between the kids that were having all day every day and they'd be learning more curriculum and the ones that, that weren't. And so then they'd be behind and we'd have, we'd have an issue throughout our elementary schools um, so I don't think you want to do that. I think that parents generally uh, will like all day, every day. Um, we've had a lot of great support for that. Teachers are totally excited about it. And um, so I don't think that we'll have any problem getting people on board with all day, every day. Okay. And is that, is that something where the parents at the parent advisory, was there any discussion? Or yeah, actually, we did bring it up at parent advisory. Um, Yes, and um, it was a great discussion, mm -hmm. and everybody thought it was a great idea. I mean, really, a um, lot of interest. A couple of kindergarten parents were there, and they, they said they would have loved to have that. And we did have one, I think, there that had used Kinder Academy as well. So um, felt like it was it was solid, solid experience. And I, I guess just the thing, I guess just from my point of view, I, I, I didn't have enough um, time to research and look at a bunch of studies I kind of looked at three on each side there was three that were um, opposed to it and then the three that were for it said that lots of studies were done during the 80s and stuff and they said that it wasn't done correctly or something and that they yeah but I don't thought that excuse me I, I oh, mean, yeah. just as a matter of policy here on the board I, I don't know if we could ever answer that question as a board today I mean right. if, if we're talking about what policies in the 80s were as a study being done maybe let's formulate the question then let then we can talk about whether we want to put it on the agenda we can discuss it I, I don't mean to usurp your thing over there but <laughs> sorry you just did okay <laughs> well, actually I didn't mean to <laughs> come think of it I lied All right. <laughs> you're forgiven Ms. Richley did you have other well I was wondering if it was possible to make a motion to table this make a motion okay I make a motion to table this for it was well, it something that is required to be done within a certain amount of time or well I mean it's up to you it's up to the board if you wanted to table it you can make the motion and, and then I can speak to it once the motion has been supported if there's any support for that motion okay for the purpose of discussion I make a motion to table this for the next board meeting 
There's been a motion to table. Do we have further discussion on this before we? Uh, not without support for the motion. Because okay. I have some questions to ask too on it. Do, uh, we will continue to have discussion on the item. On the topic. On oh, the topic, okay. but we need to dispose <coughs> of the motion. Well, it depends on the discussion, which, which way I'm on a table or not. You, you could reintroduce a motion to table if you so felt. All right. Not hearing support, we are back to more discussion. Mr. Folsky. <coughs> I, I have no problem with the thing. I talked to some parents, uh, maybe half a dozen of them, that got kids in kindergarten or just had kids in kindergarten, and they were saying, boy, I wish you had this program for my kids. They're the only problem, they said, the first two weeks, three weeks, it's pretty tough on the kids. Right, you know, they're going through. So maybe there can be a little fine tuning to get them in there. But um, the facilities I'm a little concerned about too. Uh, the present kindergarten I believe they have bathrooms in it and we're going to be doubling the classroom size is that going to be a problem do you well, see or the facility shouldn't be a problem because we're offering right now kinder academy in the other classrooms so we'll just take kinder academy and we won't offer that anymore and we'll have kindergarten in there but the kinder so academy doesn't have bathrooms in it I mean is that going to and another a fire department guy told me that I don't know why, but in kindergarten class, you have, a, you have to have an outdoor exit. No, that's, that's not true. Well, you, well, we have outdoor exits in a lot of our schools, but the, right. the whole fire exit process is by distance from the, from the uh, fire exit in the classroom. Well, it's, you don't have to have an outdoor door. Some a lot of classrooms don't have outdoor no, doors. No, but just for kindergarten, you have to. Oh. Well, this is what this gentleman told we, me. We used to offer, we had almost uh, 19 sections of kindergarten in this district, right. you know, 12 years ago. We have 12 now, you know, so we're going to have, um, we're going to have 12 more sections. <coughs> we have plenty of rooms in the district. As you saw from the report, right. we have lots of rooms. I mean, there's some details that will have to be worked out, and I'm sure we'll be in compliance as we always have okay. been. That means we're going to have to, uh, maybe I'm getting a little ahead of it, but with decline enrollment, we usually lose teachers. And then with this uh, kindergarten increase, we're going to have to either hire teachers or something. Do you, we, do we you have, have a to plan hire. how it's going to? Yes, we will, <laughs> we will post positions and hire teachers just as our normal process, and we'll have a displacement <coughs> process as we normally do, and, and these positions will be added in some fashion. We will, we will do that process. So we will need some more teachers to do this. Don't you, before you see what you've got to hire, don't you want to try to see who's bumping or who's available first? Well, Because we will. in the past, we usually lose about 10 teachers. Um, I appreciate the thoughts on that and we'll certainly work on that as okay. we normally do right. yeah we've we've done a lot of staffing around here since we since i've been here so yeah. we'll certainly work on this as well yes absolutely all right and the other one other comment what's uh the kinder academy employees what are gonna what's gonna happen to them those you know? jobs would be eliminated Can so some of them will apply most of them are certified teachers that are in there so they'll apply for some of these positions okay. and there's some other positions that would probably be cut along with this as well. All right, thanks questions I got. I, I would remind the board, what we're really talking about here at a policy level is, is really whether or not we support the all day kindergarten uh, as, as a policy position. The implementation of it, I think the points are well, well taken. Uh, I think the implementation challenges would begin if in fact we agree that the policy that uh, we adopt an all-day, everyday kindergarten program makes sense. So just I guess sometimes we get bogged down a little bit in the details of how it would work. I, the, the first question is, is, is this a, a policy direction that as a district we want to move in? So. Will there be an option to, or is there some way for a parent in the future, like say we pass this now, can a parent opt out in the future? Is there something that because I know some parents were saying that, you know, they're stay-at-home moms or dads and they want to 
kind of stay half the time with their kids or something? Is that something? That no, that, that won't be an option. If we go to a full day, every day program, that's what our program will be. So if okay. students are going to attend, that's what they'll be. They'll be attending full day every day. And I mean, if you've seen this across the state and across the nation, um, parents adjust very nicely and, uh, and students do as well. And uh, we're certainly not the first ones to, to jump into this. And, um, and it's important for us to be competitive with other districts around us as well. Um, and, and speaking of the details of things, and, and one reason why it's, we brought this forward now, because we have kindergarten roundup coming up in six weeks. We have a lot of details to put together um, in regards to working with staff and, and figuring out exactly what the curriculum will look like and all of these details that were being mentioned, all of that stuff has to be worked out. But I can tell you that the staff is extremely mm -hmm. ecstatic about this option. I know the principals are, um, everyone in our professional ranks thinks it's a great idea. Um, the only reason we haven't done it is because of the cost. So if there's a concern about the cost, that's really the reason why we haven't done it. $500,000, but yet the state is saying that they're going to charge us a million if we don't do it. Right. So it's a 500. So it's 500 to the good. <laughs> you know, so, so cost becomes a non-factor when that gets factored in. I mean, there's still some, some districts that are holding out. I talked to a friend of mine on the west side. They don't have the classrooms. They're going to have to put portables in to do this. But yet it's still cost effective for him to do it as, as opposed to lose the money for half, half day, half pay from the state. So um, we don't have that problem, unfortunately, in some respects. We have lots of empty rooms that we could use, um, but we're already using the rooms for Kinder Academy right now, so it's not a matter of really even taking any of our empty rooms. It's a matter of using our Kinder Academy rooms for kindergarten instead. So it's a, it's a, it's a good idea. I think you'll be satisfied with the result. Mr. McNamee. No, I was just going to say, okay, if we don't do it, then who's going to write the check for the half a million that we're going to send back? And that's is all. That, right? Is that something that they already decided, though, that they're well, going to the, do? Well, the governor put it in his uh, executive proposal, and the legislature passed it last year as intent for this coming fall. So most it seems study. pretty likely that they have decided that this is what they're doing. But we won't know until the State Aid Act is approved, and th that won't be until June, which is, or May, you know, or whatever. No, I'm sorry for continuing this, but if before there was a time that there, that there wasn't, or that there was all day kindergarten, and then they changed it, was there, is there even speculation as to why that was or I don't I don't recall I mean it's not been in my career that there's ever been all day every day kindergarten of course that's only 33 years so <laughs> I don't go back as far as Polsky <laughs> <laughs> well we certainly had exhaustive conversation when we went to alternate day all day kindergarten yes, the research true. that was brought up then was was pretty compelling that you know had we had the resources we should have just done it then we didn't have the resources uh, I think the uh, certainly the the research since then suggests that you know if we want to be competitive globally and every other way that we've got to get our kids started sooner in in school and you know I think uh, to leave some kids behind in kindergarten just means they're going to be behind in first grade and I think most early uh, education experts would say that uh, if you fall behind that early you just never catch up and I think it's a it would be a, it's a great service that we're able to, to offer and you know, beyond the $500,000, I think it's the right thing to do. And the fact that it costs us 500, I guess, is that's the way it is. Was there any research done after we switched from whatever it was before to what it is now? Is there any research showing that it increased the? We did an evaluation the first uh, couple years. And um, actually, the first year that we went to all day alternate day, we did offer a half day program. Mm -hmm. um, and we had one class of half day and that lasted for one year. The next year we offered it and we did not have enough to have a class. Okay. So we've had that ever since. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All those, hearing no further discussion, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We will now move on to our discussion items. Uh, the first item for discussion is a policy relating to 
bullying and other aggressive behavior towards students. Dr. Green. Thank you. Well, as you know, um, the legislature passed an anti-bullying law um, in December. And so part of that law had several requirements that districts have to put in their policy. So although we had a policy that was existing on this, this new policy includes all of the components that was required. So if you look on page 18, first of all, um, you know, it starts off with a safe and nurturing educational environment and, uh, and it actually states right in here that bullying or aggressive behavior um, is strictly prohibited. And so it lists all the different people there that it's prohibited by, which includes everyone. And then it also talks about what that bullying might include, which is physical, verbal, psychological, gestures, comments, threats, actions. So it's very detailed. Um, it also requires on page 19 a notification to be posted each year in school buildings, so we will be doing that. Um, it also requires that the superintendent is responsible to implement this policy. So even though the board passes the policy, you know, next month, then basically it's directing me to make sure that this stuff is taken care of. Um, the next policy or the next point on page 20 is just procedure. You know, any student that believes they have been a victim of bullying should immediately report. Um, every student is encouraged and required to report any situation they believe to be aggressive behavior towards a student. So these types of things are what was required to have a procedure. Um, we also uh, talk about what happens in the investigation. If it happens that they, it has occurred, then it's going to result in prompt and appropriate remedial action. This may include up to expulsion or discharge for an employee or exclusion from parents or guests or uh, so on and so forth. So um, the individual responsible for conducting the investigation shall document the incidents and report those and we have to report now to the board on an annual basis um, the bullying incidents that have occurred in the past year. So we'll have a protocol for doing that. We'll get that information from the buildings and then we'll report that to the board. Um, we also have a spot on page 21 for false reports. So if there's a false report, um, that is also considered a violation of policy. And so that's in there as well. So making an intentionally false report um, for the purpose of getting someone in trouble is prohibited and will not be tolerated. And that may result in disciplinary action. So that's another point that was in there. The last part of the policy includes definitions. So things like uh, aggressive behavior are defined, at school is defined, um, bullying itself is defined, and so you see that there, and, and this includes electronic, digital, um, PDAs, wireless handheld devices, um, and it can include stuff that happens at home as well. So if a kid uh, does bullying from his home, but it affects the school, then we can act. And so we have that covered in here as well. And then harassment is listed. Um, <coughs> and then a uh, couple other definitions. So this is a very complete policy. It's um, provided by Neola in a special edition and um, open for discussion if there's questions. Any initial questions for Dr. Green? What was their, Mr. Richmond? What was their policy before on all this stuff? Was, is this all added new stuff? This is a replacement policy. Um, the policy before had a lot of this in it, but it did not have each specific detail. Okay. So we, we, we've got that now. Okay. Question that I had, and I, I don't know, maybe it's covered in the policy, but, uh, and you were kind of alluding to uh, stuff that can take place at home on the computer or emails or whatever. What, what during the summertime or, or when students, in quotes, are not in school, does this, do we have authority or does this policy apply uh, for a student who is well I mean that's a good question I think summertime is probably the most gray area because it really would only affect the school as if it spills over into school so like on the first day of school if there's a incident or a fight or a confrontation over what had happened in the summer then I think we mm -hmm. would have jurisdiction to deal with it 
but if it resolves itself in the summer, yeah. then we're not going to be involved. I got one quick question. Is Mr. It, Fulski. Yes. Is this going to somehow be in a student's handbook coming in? Or? Not, not the whole policy, but oh. a lot of points will be in the student handbook. So we will look at the student handbook and make sure our right. that fall, falls with this. Okay. So if there are questions or you have thoughts between now, Mr. McNamee. I would just simply say that I think that the, the, the question of the summer issue is a good question. It should be explored um, because I can see situations where somebody can say something or do something in the summer that's going to affect attendance or something else mm -hmm. in the following week or the following two weeks or whatever that may in fact impact it. And that student has to know that even if someone did it before school started that somehow they're going to be protected when they get here that we're you know that that's so I think we're gonna have to explore right. that issue a little okay thank you any other thoughts all right our last item of business is the uh, board calendar which you have in your materials and takes you through March of 2013 and with all of our business being concluded we stand adjourned <laughs>